If you've seen the Disney movie The Hunchback of Notre Dame, or if you know the Broadway adaptation of it, then you'll be familiar with a festival called Topsy Turvy Day, otherwise known as the Feast of Fools. This is a medieval festival where social customs are abandoned and roles are reversed, especially in religious contexts. During this festival, one person would be crowned the Archbishop of Fools, who would dress up in the regalia of office and parade around and be sort of a master of ceremonies, if you like. The point of the festival is to upend social norms and to make fun of what is otherwise serious and sacred material and beliefs. Now, although the origin of the Feast of Fools is unknown, we can't really say for sure, although there are several theories, its proceedings bear resemblance to a Roman festival that was celebrated in the middle of December that might be Rome's most famous festival. I'm talking about the Saturnalia. Today, we're looking at this ancient carnival and exploring its history, customs, and social significance in ancient Rome. Welcome to Hearth of Hymonia. My name is Kate, and it is party time. The Festival of Saturnalia was held every year from December 17th to December 23rd. If you're watching this on the day of upload, that means that Saturnalia begins tomorrow, according to our Gregorian calendar. So if you want to celebrate, it's not too late. Stay tuned to the end of this video. I'm going to be giving you some tips and ideas for how to celebrate this fun festival from ancient Rome if you should want to do so. Saturnalia was a festival dedicated to the god Saturn, hence the name. Saturn is the Roman equivalent of the Greek god Kronos, who is one of the old gods, the father of Zeus and Hera, so on the Roman side, Jupiter, Juno, and so on. In both Greek and Roman mythology, using the respective names of the god, Saturn, or Kronos, ruled over a mythological golden age. This is a period in human history when the Earth bore everything that a, per a person or a society would need to survive without any work from humans. There was no need for agriculture, no need for building tools. Uh, there was no need for, say, naval technology. I know a lot of myths when naval technology comes in, that's when everything starts to go downhill, oddly enough. Um, and importantly, there's no need for fighting and there's no need for slavery. Slavery was a fact of life in the ancient world, and the Golden Age was supposed to be a time when there was no work at all, whether it was voluntary or forced. So this will come into play a lot when we talk about the themes of Saturnalia. Now, as I've said, Saturn is the Roman equivalent of Greek Kronos, whose name means time, think chronological, chronology, any of those words, this is all under the jurisdiction of Kronos. Saturn, likewise, is a god of time. Just like the planet Saturn in modern astrology represents chronological time, the passing of time, these are all things that fall under the jurisdiction of this god. And just like Saturn, Kronos was also honored with a festival. It was called the Cronia, after his name, and it was celebrated in the summer. We don't know a tremendous amount about it, but there's some evidence here and there that suggests that maybe role reversal was also a part of this festival, just like it is in the Saturnalia. Now, one important custom of the Cronia, which is the same as in the Saturnalia, as we'll see, was that during the festival, slaves would be temporarily freed and given a feast that was put on by the people who were normally their masters. So this is an unusual custom. We will discuss it quite a bit when we get to actually talking about the Saturnalia, but here I just wanted to point out that this also happened in the Greek version of the festival that was dedicated to the same god, even though it was under a different name. Now, the customs of the Saturnalia are much more well-documented than their Greek counterpart. 
Public rituals took place at the Temple of Saturn in the Roman Forum, and they were conducted by priests. Now, apparently the date was chosen because on December 17th, in whatever year it was, that was the day that the Temple of Saturn was officially dedicated and opened. So that's why they celebrated it on December 17th. The festival used to only last for one day, but over time, days got added here and there, and so it ended up being a bunch of days from the 17th to the 23rd. The main theme of the Saturnalia festival was liberation. This is general liberation of all people from all responsibilities. As a result of that, businesses were closed, kids got off of school, people didn't have to go to work, the government didn't function during those days, and everybody was just celebrating the festival. And this is because, as I said, Saturn ruled over the golden age when all work in all of its forms was completely unnecessary. So this is to commemorate that golden age. The only people that had to work on Saturnalia were the priests. Obviously, if you're going to have a religious festival, you need someone to carry out the religious festival, but the priests did enjoy a little bit of the fun. I talked about role reversal and upending social norms, and priests during this time would perform the rituals without covering their heads with the folds of their toga. Now, priests always covered their heads for religious duties, so this was a marked difference from what normally went on. Now, celebrating liberation meant that you could do whatever you want. So drunken revelry, dancing, gambling, these were all encouraged behaviors during the Saturnalia festival. There would be all sorts of partying happening, and this is why the festival has become so famous, because it's a time to just let loose, hang out, have fun, go dancing, spend all of your money, you know, it's a great time. And again, all of this activity was permitted even for people who otherwise were currently enslaved. And that brings me to the last point I wanna make about liberation here is the custom of temporarily freeing slaves and not only allowing them to participate in the proceedings and the merriment of the festival in general, but actually the masters taking a step back and serving the slaves. If you're saying, that doesn't sound good enough, slavery is still bad. Yes, absolutely, slavery is still bad. Now, the liberation customs of Saturnalia for slaves were not just limited to meals and being allowed to gamble. Another custom that was part of the Saturnalia celebration was the fact that slaves were allowed and even encouraged, in some cases, to speak out against their masters. The idea here is that they could do this without fear of retribution, and that was a huge deal for people who otherwise didn't have a free voice. It's more than just partying in games and drinking a lot. Um, it's actually a time to voice real serious concerns, and although a lot of Romans probably wouldn't have cared or taken any action, it's possible that some might have. Now, obviously this does not make up for the institution of slavery, and it doesn't make that much of a difference in the lives of people who were going through that. But the Romans saw the Golden Age, which just by its name alone, they saw that as something to aspire to. Now, they thought that a society without slavery was impossible. They, they did try to aspire to it and, and look to it, and they celebrated it once a year. So even though it doesn't justify it, even though it doesn't make up for it, it's a slight step in the right direction. Another element of Saturnalia, which is an element in almost all Roman religious festivals, was sacrifice. Custom dictated that sacrifices be made to the gods, and each god had their own preference of what they liked to be given. Not all sacrifices included animals, but a lot did, especially when we're talking about the major deities, and Saturn is one of the major deities. On Saturnalia, Saturn's preference of animal was sacrificed to him, and that is a suckling pig. Why a suckling pig? Kind of a long road to get there, but bear with me. Saturn is a god of time, the passage of time, and specifically 
the cycles of time that govern plant growth and animal life cycles, in other words, really, really important stuff for agriculture. Agriculture is all about doing stuff to the ground, right? Planting, watering, tilling the soil, pulling up weeds, it all has to do with the earth. So even though we might think of Saturn as a celestial god today because of the planet Saturn, you know, has to do with outer space, the Saturn of antiquity was actually considered a chthonic deity, a deity that had to do with the earth and by extension, the things that are under the earth. This ties Saturn very, very closely to other chthonic deities like the god of the underworld, Dispater. Dispater really liked when you sacrifice suckling pigs to him, so Saturn got the same offering because they are related to each other. Thematically, I mean, they're not brothers or anything, but they're, they're related to each other thematically. Now here's the thing about sacrifices at Saturnalia. The Romans loved to talk about how much they hated human sacrifice. They would never, ever, ever do anything like that except for when they did. So there's a theory that originally Saturnalia may have included some human sacrifices. Saturn apparently likes those in addition to pigs, I guess. What, what it actually is is that Saturn had a consort in one of the myths called Lua, the Greek word for destruction. Um, and so death and destruction were part of Saturn's mythology and so death had to be part of Saturn's festival as well. However, um, the Romans really didn't like human sacrifice and they talked about how bad it was. So eventually over time, human sacrifice was replaced with images like masks um, were sacrificed to Saturn. Most likely human sacrifice came in the form of gladiator games, which the Romans loved anyway. So they're like, oh, human sacrifice is bad, but we don't mind watching men kill each other for sport. Roman logic. Um, so yeah, what probably happened was Saturnalia probably had gladiator games as part of the proceedings and then the gladiators who died and sometimes they really did die uh, would be sacrificed to Saturn. And then, as I said, over time, that custom was replaced with sacrificing non-alive things that you have to kill in order to sacrifice them to the god. And here's the other thing about that, is that all of this comes from sources that are third century CE or later, and even though this is not late Roman history by any standard and Saturnalia was alive and well during this time, this was also after Christianity was starting to get quite popular. It wasn't the official religion of the empire or anything like that. It wasn't even fully legal yet, but it was around, it was a major influence, and there were a lot of Christian writers during this time and later who were speaking out against the brutality of Roman life anyway. So I wonder a little bit, and I am totally speculating here, I just wonder if that didn't have any influence on the way that Saturnalia was written. Like, look at this barbarian festival with their barbarian customs. You know, so I don't know, just curious about that, um, thought I'd throw it out there. As part of private Saturnalia observations, gifts would be exchanged among family members and friends. A lot of times it was pottery or clay figurines or something like that. These seem to be popular at this time of year. And even the Emperor Augustus got in on the gift giving action. One of his biographers by the name of Suetonius writes a little anecdote about Augustus's gift giving habits and I'll read the part about Saturnalia. So Suetonius says, at Saturnalia and at any other time that pleased him, he would distribute gifts, some clothing, gold and silver, sometimes money of all kinds, even old ones from the time of the kings or foreign money and occasionally nothing other than goat hair cloths, sponges, fire shovels, and fire tongs, and other things of this kind with obscure and ambiguous names. Now, I have to explain this a little bit. The last group that he talks about with the fire tongs and the fire shovels and things with obscure names, these are gag gifts, prank gifts. And the reason that they're a prank, which if I have to explain the joke, it's not funny anymore. But the, the reason that these were a prank is because their names 
have double entendre meanings. So for example, the word for fire shovel in this passage is rutabulum, but this is another name for male genitalia. The idea is that Saturnalia is a goofy time and you do goofy things like giving goofy gifts with dirty names, even if you're the emperor. A feature of the festival that will be familiar to all of my fellow hunchback enthusiasts is the naming of a master of ceremonies of sorts who would oversee the events of Saturnalia. In Hunchback, it's the King of Fools. In the medieval festival that Topsy Turvy Day is based on, it's the Archbishop of Fools. It has a religious connotation to it. But in Rome, this distinguished honor was called the Saturnalicius Princeps. This translates to the Saturnalian Emperor, or maybe Chief of Saturnalia, whatever you want to say. Uh, this was a title that was appointed by lot. So basically anybody could become the Saturnalicius Princeps. And the duties were just what you would expect, presiding over drunken partying. If you want to celebrate Saturnalia on your own, think it's helpful to look at some of the calendrical, astrological, and symbolic significances of this festival to help us understand how we can observe it if that's what we want to do. Firstly, it's important to note that Rome's calendar was slightly different from the one that we use today. Julius Caesar reformed the calendar in the first century BCE, and it was adjusted slightly in the 1500s, giving us the Gregorian calendar that we use today. So Saturnalia, as I said, fell on December 17th through December 23rd. That would fall roughly around the time of December 21st for us. And if a light bulb just went off in your head, yes, I'm talking about the winter solstice, also called Yule and celebrated as Yule in, in certain traditions. Now the winter solstice is the shortest day of the year, but it's also the last day when the days will get shorter. And after that, the sun will grow in strength and the days will get longer as we anticipate spring and summer. So in a lot of cultures, the winter solstice is actually a festival of light. And some scholars have suggested that this aspect was present in Saturnalia as well. Now I talked about gift giving, but I didn't specifically mention one gift that was pretty well attested for Saturnalia and that is the gift of candles. These could also be part of your offerings to the god. So you can incorporate candles into your Saturnalia observance. This goes great with other winter holidays. And keep in mind, even though our calendar is different, the winter solstice does fall right in the middle of Saturnalia on our calendar. So you can still get the solstice part in, even if it doesn't line up exactly with ancient Roman timekeeping. Now, another thing, about Saturnalia and its solar aspects, its light aspects, is that Saturnalia goes right up to the birth of the god Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun. Now, this god is like a whole series of videos in and of himself. Basically, long story short, solar deity that was often worshipped monotheistically in later centuries became very popular among Rome's military, beginning in about the third century, I would say. Now, this god that was worshipped in a monotheistic kind of way, he was the only god worshipped by some Roman circles, was born on December 25th. I I'm sure that's not important. Anyway, all I'll say about his birthday is that it's very close to the winter solstice. And so immediately after Saturnalia, the winter solstice, we get another light and sun god. So this really is a time about light and bringing light into the darkness and all of the stuff associated with that. So if you wanted to incorporate light as part of your observance, I think that would be perfectly applicable and suitable. On the astrological side of things, Saturnalia falls right into Capricorn season. Capricorn season this year begins on December 22nd. So again, if we're celebrating from the 17th to the 23rd, it's right in that. Now in astrology, the planet that governs Capricorn is Saturn. So if you're into astrology and you want to bring in Saturnalia, you can do it as part of your preparations for Capricorn season, or you can celebrate Saturnalia and continue it 
all the way through Capricorn season. And if you want to go really far in antiquity, so I'm talking like pre-Hellenistic astrology, the original sign that Saturn ruled was Aquarius, which comes after Capricorn. So theoretically, you could celebrate Saturn right up through February if you wanted. Looking at the themes of Saturnalia, I think the best way that you can celebrate this holiday is to let loose, have fun, give gifts, show gratitude, have a drink, pour one out for the gods. You could make a pork dinner if that's something you're interested in, if you wanted to represent that sacrifice, but if you are not a pork eater or not a meat eater, like I said, candles are a very good offering, and Saturnalia coincides with other gift-giving holidays, so giving gifts, which is something that a lot of people were gonna do anyway, is another way that you can celebrate this Roman festival. I hope you've enjoyed this breakdown of Saturnalia. I hope you found it useful in some way. In the spirit of the season, I am toasting Yo Saturnalia to all of you. Thank you for watching my videos. There's a lot more people who are coming here and watching and interacting, and I'm seeing all of the wonderful comments that you've left me. I really appreciate those. I read them all. I try to answer whenever I can. And I just appreciate you still showing up to watch the videos. I haven't been uploading as much lately, but I'm hoping to get back on schedule in the new year. So with all of that, I wish you happy Saturnalia, happy holidays, and I will see you in a couple of weeks.